Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that we can be here this morning as we open your word, as we look at some issues and, and concepts. Would you uh, make things clear to our hearts, we pray. Amen. So when the world of Isaiah was telling him and telling themselves they didn't want anything to do with the things of God, let's write him out of our lives, let's write his ways out, let's do it our way, Isaiah was told by God to gather in the Torah and live out the Torah in testimony. In other words, when the world is saying, leave the word of God aside, we have a better way, God calls his people to be exhibits on planet Earth that there is another way to live and that living life God's way is life. It's not just a few thrills on the way to death. That's the best the world can offer you is a little fun, a uh, little food on the way to an inevitable demise. God says, my words are life. This Torah, these words are life. And so we've been looking at Torah and asking ourselves, do we even believe what's in the first few chapters? We've been looking at the scientific aspects relating to God, creation, short uh, chronology, God creating the world in six days, our position in creation as image of God or just the latest evolution, and how we relate to our environment. We have looked at uh, cosmology, which is Where'd the stuff come from? Bang or God? We've looked at biology. Where did life come from? Spontaneous generation from non-life or God? And we've, we've talked about creation. Do we believe in a literal creation? We can't prove either way. Do we believe in the genealogies, the long lifespans? Do we believe we're descended from something higher? or ascended from something lower? Those are the two issues. Are we top-down thinkers or bottom-up thinkers? Which is it? And when you get to talking about the flood, we've, been, we've gone through the story of the flood, global flood, God saving the world from its own inevitable self-annihilation by destroying the destroyers before they could completely destroy everyone and rescuing representatives of human beings and animals in the ark that floated out a flood that annihilated and changed the face of the world. Now, as I've been reading on this subject, I've come to the conclusion, and this may not be startling for you, but kind of shook down for me, that the core dogma or doctrine that we have as Christians is in the first few words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. We are supernaturalists. We believe that we're not the top of the food chain in the universe. We're not the smartest. We're not the end of the line. We're not the highest evolution. We believe that there is a realm of existence that transcends ours by light years. We believe in God. That means we believe in the supernatural. We believe in things that are above, beyond what we can see. We believe there's more going on than meets the eye. The cardinal dogma of modern evolutionary science is naturalism. And however you slice naturalism, it boils down to one very simple thing. You've got to figure out everything without there being a God. Science has written into its own self-definition that God cannot exist. And if he did, we can't figure out who he is, where he is, and he had nothing to do with anything that's going on. We're on our own. Naturalism. The present is the key to the past. We believe the past is the key to the present. You understand? We're going absolutely opposite directions.
The present tells us what happens in the past according to naturalism. The past tells us where we are in the present according to supernaturalism. Are we bottom up, the latest evolution from slime, or are we top down? We've fallen from something higher and God is taking us back there. You see, this is once again why I find it so strange that we as Christians keep trying to go to the intellectual elite of this world and get them to tell us we're smart by somehow finding a way to make our stuff agree with their stuff when our stuff starts at opposite ends and passes going the opposite direction. I believe we should get our validation from God of who we are, whether we're intellectual, whether we're smart, whether we have value. We should get that from God. And it really doesn't matter what the intellectual elite of this world think of us. If we have to have them think highly of us, for us to think highly of ourselves, it's because we're insecure. And by the way, the fact that the intellectual elite want to force us to agree with them tells me they are insecure. Because if you are secure in who you are, you don't have to force your viewpoint to be the only one that is allowed to be discussed. You only do that when you're not secure in it. Which tells me all the argument that no other view should be in public school, no other view should be in education, tells me they're not as certain as they want us to think they are. Because if you're certain, you're not afraid of people bringing other evidence. The other point I want to make today is that we do not need to disprove what science is teaching. We just need to know what we believe and why we believe it. We do not need the approval and we don't need to disprove. Both are wild goose chases that end up getting us nowhere, just circling the mountain, running in circles. And what I want to talk about today is, um, is uh, the evidence for the global flood. And I do not want to talk about it in a way that tries to disprove the arguments of science in these same areas. They could be right, I could be wrong. I wasn't there, they weren't there. Right? I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I just need to know who I am, what I believe, and where I stand. You see, the cardinal doctrine of evolutionary science is, is naturalism, which by definition means nothing can have happened other than what is naturally visible within our world today. And that leads to the concept of uniformitarianism, which says things have always been the same way they are today. The, cra the crazy thing with science is, even though they believe in uniformitarianism, based on naturalism, when people like Francis Crick, who was one of the co-mappers of DNA back in the 50s and 60s, finally came to the conclusion from his own study that there's no way the human cell could have spontaneously generated from non-living matter, he then postulated the idea of transpermia, that extraterrestrials seeded the world with living cells. Now you can do that as long as they're bottom up too. You just can't call it God. They've got to be the result of natural processes with no supernatural. Now I don't know where they got the life that they seeded here. It just adds a few more tens of billions of years for it to accidentally happen. But that's the point. Naturalism actually has what they call actualism. They will come up with all kinds of unprovable hypotheses or postulations relating to what might have happened as long as it does not open the window for the possibility of God. Human beings have to be at the top of the pecking order. Remember what Satan said in Genesis 3 to the woman at the tree, to Eve. He said, you won't really die, but God knows if you, if you eat of this tree, therefore if you sin, God knows that you will become higher 
knowing good and evil. You see, Satan has always been on his way working himself up. And modern science and modern intellectual philosophy is exactly in line with that. If you will discard God, you can elevate yourself. Nothing new under the sun. It's interesting when we start looking at the flood and science and naturalism, the original scientists, if you were to, who are some of the great scientists of, you know, long ago? What are the names you come up with? Copernicus? Newton? Kepler? Galileo? Boyle, those are two, five of the big ones. They were all believers in God. They were all theologians, along with being scientists. In the Middle Ages, the church, if you didn't understand, the, understand how something in nature worked, the church had said, it's just a miracle. Sing another hymn, give another offering, and meditate on God. Where these guys finally began to say, no, wait a minute. If God is intelligent and we're made in his image, then we should be able to discern how the things he made works. And so all the great original scientists were looking at the handiwork of God and science was trying to figure out what God had done. And then science evolved <laughs> into evolution. You see, in the mid-1700s, it became popular and possible due to the Reformation and the Renaissance and the weakening of the medieval church's power, it became survivable to begin to question the church and the religion of the Middle Ages and their view of things. And with the rise of the Enlightenment, it became fashionable to not believe in the church and the Bible it taught supposedly. And in reality, the concepts of deep time, millions of years, and naturalism and evolution actually came in as philosophies before they really had scientific evidence to back them up. They were intellectual postulations looking for a definition in the real world. Kepler said the chief aim of all investigation of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed upon it by God. These believers in God went up against the medieval church's miracle approach and they began to contemplate, try to contemplate and understand what God had done. Modern science claims that such views prevent you from being a true science, scientist. Modern science now by definition would call all of those five and other great scientists of old unscientific because they believe in God. Belief in the supernatural prevents you from doing good science, they say. You have to have a devotion to naturalism, which means you believe there is no supernaturalism. Yet these early scientists believed the biblical story, including the global flood, they saw the evidence as they began to investigate. They believed that the sedimentary rock that we see in the Grand Canyon was laid down by the global flood. But in the mid-1700s, the Enlightenment put man at the center and threw God out. Men began looking for explanations independent of the Bible, and it became fashionable in intellectual circles to reject the Bible. Noah's flood was intellectually rejected not because of scientific reasons initially, not because of factual data or superior reasoning, but because the biblical account fell out of favor with the intellectual elite. It was assumed untrue, not based on evidence, but on a fashionable theory. And the theory went in search of a justification, and you will usually find what you're looking for. So the flood was rejected in favor of mental construct, the result of a choice, all before there was any knowledge of the rocks or the fossils to speak of. The founders of uniformitarianism were committed to deep time before they had the evidence, and they set out to destroy the belief in the Bible and the flood in order to back up the concept of naturalism and 
deep time. Naturalism and uniformitarianism has become the dominant uh, geology, geology. This core principle does not allow any possibility of considering that Noah's flood was real. The global flood has never been proven wrong. It's been scrapped due to antagonism to the Bible and social influences accompanied by mocking and bullying of any other belief, calling those who believe in it ignorant, stupid, or insane, or insincere. Any view other than the natural one is seen as blind religious zeal, and any scientist who disagrees is apt to lose his career. But uniformitarianism remains largely unquestioned because it's the only view allowed to be taught and the students accept it because it's all they've been exposed to. Science evolved from seeking to understand God's creation to seeking to understand creation without God. If we get our validation from God, we need neither the approval of the intellectual elite nor we need, do we need to disprove their theories. We just need to know what we believe and be secure enough to smile and know who we are no matter what we get called. Now let me ask you a question. We're not going to get nearly far enough on this today, but what's new in the series? If there was a global flood which covered the entire world about 4,500 years ago, should we be able to see evidence for it in the geological world? Overwhelming evidence should be there if it happened. That's very recent in geologic time, 4,500 years, against millions and billions, supposedly. So, if we look at geology and geomorphology, again, geomorphology is a sub-specialty within geology. Geology tends to look at the rock layers and the fossils therein and try to understand the history of what's happened on planet Earth. Geomorphology looks at the morphing of the geo. <laughs> you got that? The shaping of the world's surface and ask how it got this way. How did the Grand Canyon get dug out? You know, how did Everest go up? How come there are flat spots? And how come there are canyons? And how come there are cuts through mountains by rivers that should have gone around? You know, how come this stuff exists? That's geomorphology. What would we expect, looking at geomorphology and geology, what would we expect this world to look like if the global Genesis flood really happened? And what I found very interesting is in a number of books that I have been reading, the answer is exactly what we see. Really? You'd think based on what you hear in science class and on every TV program that's, that there's no evidence. They keep saying there's no evidence of the global flood. Well, what I think they're saying is there's no evidence that absolutely proves the global flood. But neither is there evidence that disproves the global flood and there's an awful lot of evidence I think the world looks just exactly like it should if there had been a global flood 4,500 years ago let's talk about it a little bit see how far we can get on this first of all if the world was completely covered by water there should be evidence that the world was completely covered by water that's heavy that's deep okay High and dry sea creatures on mountaintops worldwide, water deposited strata full of marine fossils at all elevations worldwide. It should, there should be evidence that at one point, every place you can walk around on planet Earth was covered by water. And actually, science will agree with that. It just won't allow it to all be at the same time. Much of the present day landscape cannot be explained solely in terms of current processes or even those that operated uh, in the geologically recent past, but many scientists recognize that almost all landforms are relics of a different past. All landforms, uh, typical current landforms that you see out there, are not actually being formed today. They're being destroyed today by erosion. 
Current landforms cannot have been shaped only by or even largely by present day processes, but are being eroded away by present day processes. One thing is clear. The landforms of our world were shaped by water. Science will agree with that. They just won't allow it to have all been at the same time. But if there was a flood, we should expect the evidence that water covered the world. And indeed, that is agreed on. Even the very top of Mount Everest is water laid, is water deposited strata that was pushed up by tectonic action later. Millions of years ago or thousands of years ago? Well, none of us were there. But there are fossils in the rocks on the top of Mount Everest and the top of the Rockies and the top of the Alps and everywhere else. Everything except volcanoes, which came about by a totally different way, give evidence that they were once covered by water. So number one's pretty much a no-brainer. Oh, I think I actually had a slide. I kind of like that graphic. I thought that was an interesting cutaway graphic of the flood. A lot of water. A whole lot of water. Number two. If there indeed was a catastrophic global flood that wiped out animals, vegetation, etc., the world should be a global graveyard. Right? Everywhere we go, we should find the remains of dead stuff. Plants, animals, etc. And you simply start looking in the rock strata everywhere and you find fossils galore. Fossils, fossils everywhere. Fossils of animals, fossils. By the way, 95% of all fossils are marine. But you find three things on every continent, everywhere. You find fossils, you find coal beds, and you find oil fields. All of which are the result of the death of massive amounts of living things. So, just very simply, if there was a global flood, you should find evidence of water having covered the world, and you should find the world to be a global graveyard. And that's exactly what we find. Now, you can explain it one way or another, but that fits. Number three, one of the amazing things you should find is that fossils were quickly buried rather than it being a long process. Now, if something dies, how long does it take for the delicate tissue to either be scavenged or decay? They say in the water it's a matter of minutes to hours. And any soft tissue is gone. It's eaten, it's decayed, and even within a very short period of time, even the hard shells fall apart for the most part, except the very hardest parts, because they're held together by organic matter. When you look at the fossils, you see preservation of the wings and the tentacles. You see preservation of the most delicate parts, the fins. In, in that little trilobite down in the corner, left-hand corner, you can actually see the makeup of the compound eye. This had to be covered and completely sealed from oxygen within minutes at best an hour or two from the time of death or the covering was the cause of death. We see the fine points. Only a face a mother could love up there to the right. But look at the detail. It's there. That kind of detail wouldn't be there after just a few hours of death in the open ocean. Interesting. These are all pictures of fossils of a fish being fossilized while eating another fish. Now that's got to happen pretty quick, doesn't it? This isn't going to be a slow death and then finally some mud comes and covers it and this all happens to, has to happen instantaneously to actually get caught in the act of your last meal and fossilized in that position. Here a baby ichthyosaur, I mean a female ichthyosaur is actually giving birth and it was fossilized. Boom. So the third item I'm suggesting is that we should find evidence of quick, cover, quick death, burial, and isolation from all other organisms and from oxygen 
and we find just exactly that. We do not find animals that died were finally covered and fossilized. We find that animals must have died in the process of being covered in which they were fossilized. This is a quick process. It doesn't fit long ages and slow things. The fourth item I want to point out is that if there was a global flood, we should find sedimentary layers, rock layers, that are vast in nature. If the Amazon River, that's the biggest, right, is going to lay out a delta, how big is that delta going to be? It might actually make it a few hundred miles wide. Most rivers make deltas that are 10, 15, 20 miles. The Columbia Delta is not that huge. And it's one of our big rivers. But when we begin looking at the strata, that you, which is all science agrees was laid down by water, you go to the White Cliffs of Dover, they're chalk. It's a strata of chalk. And that strata can be traced through France, Netherlands, Germany, Poland, southern Scandinavia, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, Middle East, and as far as Kazakhstan. That's a mighty big flood to create that kind of a spread of a strata. Um, the lowest sedimentary level in the Grand Canyon, the, tip, the Tapiz uh, sandstone, covers much of the United States. That strata can be followed. This is not a small river. This is, this is waterborne strata being laid down not just hundreds, but thousands of miles wide. Um, in Canyon de Chez, the top layer is the Shinarum conglomerate. It's over 100,000 square miles at 50 feet thick of a very coarse sand and gravel, which would require a very high current over a very large area. Nothing any river could possibly ever do to lay that heavy of strata, that heavy of material down as a strata. Remember, the course of the material in the strata, the higher the current had to be. It takes a rushing river current to move that kind of sediment, which is also the very top layer of the monuments in Monument Valley, of the Buttes in Monument Valley. When you go to uh, uh, the Grand Canyon and you look at the Coconino sandstone, I pointed it out there, it's that kind of second big layer down from the top. Covers 200,000 square miles, averaging 315 feet thick. It's not something any river could do. It's not something any local flood could do. This is continental sized stuff. And then when you look at it up close, you see the grains going different directions. It actually can be shown that it was laid down completely underwater the water creating sand dunes like wind creates sand dunes. Slow moving water now, about four miles an hour, creates sand dunes just like blowing wind creates sand dunes. And as the current changes, it fills in one dune over another and you have all of this cross bedding going on. And by the way, uh, one more item that you should find then if you have um, a global flood would be the possibility of sand and rock being transported great distances. You know, a river will transport sand and rock a certain ways, but the sand that makes up the Coconino sandstone came from, they can trace it based on its composition, northern Utah and Wyoming, about 400 miles away. That's a long ways. But even more interesting, the Navajo sandstone, which makes these beautiful uh, pictures that we all love to have on our computer screens, um, that has a special makeup which is found in Pennsylvania and New York. That composite material was pushed 1,250 miles to its present location and spread over hundreds of thousands of square miles. All I'm saying is you should expect to see stuff bigger than is possible with any geological action we see nowadays. And you see just exactly that. Another interesting thing is science believes that without any up push, uplift from the, uh, from the 
tectonic plates and fault action. And without any intervention, the world would erode itself down to sea level in between 10 and 50 million years. When they measure current erosion rates and you start going into millions of years, the world would be flat and underwater within 50 million years. Some say as short as 10 million. Now here's what's interesting. When you look at the strata in the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon is the greatest evidence in the world, or the, the greatest geological uh, playground in the world, I think. It's, it's an incredible, that and the Grand Staircase to the north of it. A knife edge, straight flat, between the Hermit Shale and the Coconino Sandstone. And yet science says that there were tens of millions of years between those when those layers were laid down. How can it be flat if there were tens of millions of years? Wouldn't there be valleys eroded in it? Wouldn't we see places where it dipped and was filled in by the upper? In tens of millions of years. In tens of millions of years, the entire platform should have been eroded away. You can't have erosion taking us down to sea level in 10 to 50 million years and have 10 to 50 million years and a flat surface that wasn't eroded. So when you look at the strata and there's layer after layer after layer going for hundreds of miles in the Grand Canyon absolutely flat without these valleys and erosion surfaces that we would expect. You know, if you have a river flooding, you have the old floodplain at the bottom and it's going to have some, some grooves uh, from erosion, uh, materially eroded away, forming stream beds and canyons. And when another flood comes in, it's going to fill those in with rock and mud and sand. And then over time, that's going to have grooves eroded in it, valleys and things. And then the next flood, you should see this kind of stuff. But instead, and by the way, that's over a short area 15 miles 10 feet deep and here we have 2,000 feet deep covering 300 miles absolutely flat and supposedly tens of millions of years between the laying, laying down of those layers it makes no sense it doesn't work that's the kind of thing that would happen in rapid layer after layer being laid down by something like a global flood. And actually geologists admit it looks for the world like it was laid down rapidly layer after layer, but it can't have been because of the fossils in it. But the fossils have been aged by the theory of evolution, so evolution claiming the age of the fo fossils now says that the age of the strata has to match the fossils, which matches their philosophy, which becomes circular reasoning. Now maybe it was the way they said, all I'm trying to say is there's really good evidence for the global flood. This is what you'd expect to see if there really was a global flood. When you go to the Grand Canyon, I've given you a couple of graphics here. Um, you've got all these different layers starting with the Tapit Sandstone all the way up to the Kaibab Formation at the top. That's about 4,500 feet of layer after layer after layer with a flat line in between. The one on the right shows exactly the same thing, just gives a little more detail. I know it's a little small to see and I wasn't going to rebuild it. It's as big as I could put it up there. But here's the amazing thing, folks. It doesn't stop at the top of the Grand Canyon what's called the Grand Staircase to the north, the bottom of this layer of, of this graphic is the top of the Grand Canyon. And it keeps going up and up and up and up and up. All these flat layers, another about Grand Canyon and a half in height. This is vertical. Um, I know it's way too small for you to read, but I put on the left-hand side, the Grand Canyon is the bottom third. And the rest are the rest of the layers which were laid down and then catastrophically washed off of the top of the Grand Canyon but left to the north. And then 
upward push of the tectonic plates leaned it all back so you don't actually go up another 9,000 feet because it's all slanted, but you can go up out of the Grand Canyon and keep going up the stair step all the way to Bryce Canyon and the Pink Cliffs. All of that laid down without erosion in between, rapidly laid down some 10,000 to 15,000 feet of strata. How in the world did that get there without erosion in between? One, if you allow yourself the option of God, having brought a world flood, it fits perfect. Now, if you disallow the possibility of the supernatural, then you've got to figure out some other way that it got there. And that's what science has done. Remember, I put a quote up a few weeks ago. The believer in God must explain one thing, the existence of suffering. The unbeliever, however, must explain the existence of everything else. So we're going to call a halt right here. I got a lot more. Um, here's the point. We do not have to disprove, belittle, or bully the other side. But we do not want to let them tell us what is truth. A side that believes there can be no God cannot give valid information to a side that starts with God. Does that make sense? You're, you get the right answers by asking the right questions. And if you categorically deny the supernatural, you're going to have to find theories of how it happened. And there's good evidence for the theories, but there's good evidence against the theories. I think the best evidence points to a rapid laying down of all these strata on a catastrophic level. There is no present process going on in nature that does this kind of stuff. How did it happen? The Bible gives a story that fits. I can't prove it. I can't disprove the other side. But I think there's good evidence for what I believe. Does that make sense? And I'll give you a little more next time around. But let's not go on a wild goose chase and ask, act unchristlike by belittling the other side or trying to prove other people wrong. That's not our job. Our job is to believe the truth and live Jesus Christ for all the world to see. And hold our heads up high and not be at all intimidated if somebody calls us unscientific. It's almost like calling you unintelligent. No, I'm sorry. I believe in God. I believe in the supernatural. I think there's lots of evidence for it, but I can't prove it. I think there's as much evidence for that as there might be supposed evidence for long ages. And I'll go with it. What about radiocarbon data? What about a radioisotope uh, dating? These, these layers are supposedly dated at billions and millions of years of age. What about that? What about the fossils um, and their supposed age based on the dating of the strata? Um, I had that all here, but we'll cover that next time because there's some very important stuff to see there. But please, folks, this is not to go out and disprove anybody. We don't have to make everybody agree with us. We just need to know what we believe and hold our heads high because we know in whom we have believed and we know that he is able to see us through. We know that we are going back to where we came from and praise the Lord, that is not slime, that is glory. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for sending people who ask the right questions and show us data so that we can see your handiwork, that we can look at nature, we can look at geology, we can look into the face of God rather than the face of blank. 
Jesus, we choose to believe in you. Forgive us for wanting the approval of those who don't even believe in you. Forgive us for getting sidetracked out of our own insecurity and trying to disprove those who don't believe in you. It almost gives them ammunition because we don't act like you when we're trying to do that. Would you please let us know you and live out your life so others can see that you are real and your ways are life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.